We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Lobo Tigre, author and publisher of the IndependentSpeculator.com. Lobo, thanks for joining me today. Happy to be back on the show, Tom. It's been a while, a lot going on. Absolutely. Again, always a broken record. There's so many new pieces of news and information to talk about here. But I thought we could start by touching on something that I came across in my research for today's discussion. That's You were saying that there is a new buyer in the physical gold space and that you were actually wrong about why gold was your highest conviction trade for this year. Right. So I'm not the only one who's pointed out the new buyer. And a lot of people are saying, oh, it's all China, China, China. Um, mixed blessing. As we record this, we've just come from a big drop in gold the previous week because the People's Bank of China announced that it didn't buy any gold for a month, mm -hmm. which is A, irrelevant. <laughs> and B, you know, if you're a gold bug and you're relying on a communist central bank to be your the basis of your uh, investment, <laughs> you know maybe there's something not quite right with that equation there that ought to, ought to be reconsidered. Um, but the new buyer isn't the People's Bank of China, and you know that's important because the the reaction that you know we've just seen. Was I thought over the top, and therefore the correction, such as we have in the gold space and in the gold stocks, absolutely an opportunity. If the market's overreacted to a pause on the PBOC gold buying, I think it's reasonable to expect. I, I think the odds are very high that next month they'll show that they did buy some more. Mm -hmm. Because why would China stop buying? Are they going to suddenly trust the United States dollar the way they? I mean, maybe didn't trust isn't the right word, but rely on it the way they did before the U.S. weaponized it in, in the latest wars. You know, the, the reasons for central bank gold buying have not gone away. So, you know, they're central banks. They do what they want to do. They pause for a month. I really don't think that was a signal of the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I see it as an opportunity. And so if there was a big sell-off when they paused, and if you think that they're going to start again, which I do, then there's an opportunity to get in before they start again. And maybe we'll see the opposite of that sell-off. We'll see a big surge. Oh, hey, China's buying again. But that's not the new buyer. The Chinese have been buying for years. And the other central banks that got that wake-up call when, when the U.S. seized Russia's reserves and they kicked the Russians out of the SWIFT system, you know, those guys aren't suddenly comfortable with all of their financial lifeblood flowing through New York again. So... I just think the whole thing is is wrongheaded and absolutely an opportunity or a source of opportunity. You still have to be selective in what you buy. But but I, I love the setup. When the market makes a mistake, when it sells something for the wrong reason, and you're right and they're wrong, I mean, you know, we'll see who's right. You know, the, the proof will be in the pudding at the end of the day. But if anybody who agrees with me is right and the market is wrong, that is a source of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I think it's pretty cool. Now, the other thing that you said that was important, you know, this um, this new buyer is not, you know, I I don't have a crystal ball. I didn't expect uh, some new buyer to appear on the scene this year. My reasons for uh, calling gold my highest conviction trade in 2024 were the I think still impending recession, the reaction, the money helicopters flying again, uh, or just the Fed cutting rates. Even if there's no big recession, just the Fed itself is saying they're they're going to cut rates, and that typically is good for gold and or silver. So that's still ahead of us. And going into an environment like that at plus or minus twenty three hundred is pretty exciting. When all of those reasons to be optimistic when we last talked about it at two thousand are still ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know that's a reason to be bullish. I think this thing we were just talking about with the market's mistake and overreaction to the news about the People's Bank of China is a mistake. Um, and then there's the question of this new buyer that I didn't foresee coming. And I, 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 you know, people are saying that it's not the People's Bank of China, it's actually the people of China, that the average Chinese person 
has seen the Chinese real estate market blow up, you know, year after year and just drastically underperform. And you have to understand that this isn't just like a market in the United States or the real estate market is important for the economy. For the Chinese mentality, real estate is a primary form of savings. That's what you do with money when you accumulate money, you, you buy real estate. And, you, you know, it's sort of a Confucian thing, you know, that is the game and whoever has the most at the end wins. Mm -hmm. um, so if that is a central thesis to, to not just an investment strategy, but, you, but more like a way of life, of solidifying savings in real estate, real estate, and suddenly it's not performing the way you think it should, or even it's losing value, your savings are going down, that, that's a crisis. And what else do you trust? Well, you don't need to convince Chinese people that gold is something, you know, that gold has been money for thousands of years and that is the store of value and all, you know, all that stuff. The Chinese are, are very educated in this. Uh, I, I remember, sorry, let me briefly digress on my, one of my first trips to China. I remember having a discussion with some high ministry type about the institutions of capitalism and attracting Western investment into mining and so on. And this is, relates to the gold question. He said, oh, it's very simple. In, in China, we have 50-year communism, and I'm not making fun of him. This is my reproduction of what he said. He said, we have 50-year communism, but we have 5,000-year capitalism. But if, like, if you think about that, the Chinese are amongst the most hardworking entrepreneurial people in the world. Mm -hmm. Just look at what they're doing to the car industry right now and amongst other industries, right? So, you know, they understand money, they understand real money, and they have long understood that gold is money. So, so I, I think there's something there, but I also think there's more to it, Tom. Uh, I, I don't want to beat this to death, but if you look at the numbers of increased Chinese retail uh, gold buying, mm -hmm. a, I don't know how much I trust the China Gold Association. I'm not sure I trust any gold association. Everybody's talking their book. But the numbers don't add up. The percentage doesn't account for the huge increase that we've seen in gold this year. Mm -hmm. So I think there's actually a broader move around the world of very deep pocketed people seeing the risks, the tail risks out there. And I think we're beginning to see something that Rick Rule, I know, has talked to you about and the audience is probably familiar with, and that is that reversion to the mean mm -hmm. of global portfolio allocation, which used to be about 2% to gold and drop to about half a percent. And if people just start getting the feeling that, you know, maybe hedging with a bit of gold would be a good idea, which I'm seeing more and more even on mainstream financial media, not most excellent things like the Palisades Gold Radio, which has long been saying this. These are the Johnny come lately. These are starting to say, maybe a bit of gold wouldn't be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what Rick was talking about. That starts happening and it has the potential to double, triple, or quadruple industry, sorry, investment demand for gold. So I, I'm not saying this is it. It's off to the races, off to the moon. Gold's quadrupling. Please don't take that the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I'm, I think this is the new buyer. We're seeing the Chinese, amongst other deep-pocketed people, moving into this space and saying, you know what? This world is pretty crazy. Let's allocate something to the world's oldest safe haven asset class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like. There have always been in some ways, but they are getting closer, these big macro forces that are positive for gold that are just looming kind of just outside the windshield, right? Yeah. And that's one of those things. Another Rick rule is don't confuse the inevitable with the imminent. Mm -hmm. Like we, We've heard arguments about why gold should go up and all the money printing and how much they may or may not have at Fort Knox and all this stuff. These arguments have been around for years, if not decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if we believe them, we think they're true. They don't tell us what to do now. What's happened in 2024, this hockey stick we've seen. And sorry, one more quick, quick brief aside. I'm not a, a broken clock on gold. Like it's always gold, but, you know, every, mm -hmm. every day it's always the best buy of gold. Last year, my highest conviction trade was uranium. This year it's gold. And the reasons for that, as I said, are still ahead. So I'm very bullish. We're going into a bullish setup for gold from a much higher base. And that's pretty exciting. But this this thing that we're talking about, I think, not a promise, but it might be gone from inevitable to imminent to happening now. If if what I'm saying is true, like if this new buyer is the sign that it's actually starting to happen, that is a game changer. And we'll just have to see how it plays out. And just to reiterate that, you think that's you know smart 
deep pocketed money that is coming into the space that realizes that they need some defensive, tangible form of wealth to be able to protect some of their purchasing power. Right. And by the way, even if some of that money goes into Bitcoin, that doesn't mean none of it goes into mm-hmm. gold. Right. You know, if Bitcoin haters or gold haters, I really think they should stop beating up on each other. The enemy is fiat. People get that. And if people are nervous, you know, let the market decide which form of savings is the best. I can see people going with both. I have heard people talking about doing both. I have seen, I can't remember which show it was on. I've seen one of these mainstream financial talking heads saying, well, you know, what else are you going to do in an environment like this? Buy gold? And the guest said, well, yeah, actually, we've allocated some of our portfolio. Like, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is that gold is a pet rock. It's worthless. It's stupid. It's, you know, it's boomer old stuff, whatever you want to call it. But, but I remember the interview being like shocked by the guest. Like, well, yes, actually. <laughs> um, so interesting times. We'll see if this really is the beginning of that that perhaps long inevitable and, and hoped for and imminent. But, you know, maybe it's starting to happen now. So Lobo, as you mentioned, this kind of looming recession, you know, we've talked about this many times, or I've talked about this many times over the past, let's say two years with guests from every spectrum of the show. But, you know, you pointed to a recent kind of crossing of data. What happens when unemployment rises to meet the long-term trend? Okay, well, a couple of things here. One is to give credit where due. That's Jeff Gunlock's number Mm -hmm. one best you know, recession predictor, going back about 80 years, the current or spot, if you will, unemployment rate uh, rising and meeting the long-term average in a three-year moving average is a 100% accurate predictor of recessions. And so that was what I was talking about. So, you know, all these people saying, oh, if there hasn't been a recession by now, we're not going to have one, you know, where are these long and variable lags? Well, A, that's an ignorant thing to say. The average length of a long and variable lag from first policy tightening to recession in the US is actually about where we are right now. Like this month or next month would only be an average of, for the US track record, long and variable lag. So it's simply historically ignorant to say if we haven't had one yet, we're not going to have one. Um, But that aside, the Gundlach indicator is telling us we will have one. Like it is now based on 80 years of track record of a 100% accurate predictor, we're going to have one. Now, this brings us back to Rick Rule again. You know, This says it's inevitable. That doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna to happen tomorrow. Remember, if we've only just now gotten to the average length of a long and variable lag, mm-hmm. people I'm sure you've talked to like Lynn Alden or, or, or Michael Hallwell talking about fiscal dominance or talking about liquidity, like all that money, the government, tr- literally trillions and trillions that the money helicopter sent out, you know, that pig has yet to work its way through the economic python. So I think it's reasonable. It's actually unreasonable to think that the long and variable lag should have been shorter and less variable this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I, I think there was a reason for that. And I think I made that mistake. And that was the, the shock of going from, you know, decade plus basically zero interest rates or effectively, you know, nailed to the floor interest rates to 500 basis points almost overnight. It was really hard to believe that that wouldn't break something else more than just three regional banks. Mm-hmm. And I think you and the audience knows exactly what I mean here. So I think a lot of us Fed skeptics thought, oh, you know, the Fed's going to break something else and we're going to see that pain sooner. And I think that's where the Lynn Alden fiscal dominance and all that stuff comes in. We didn't realize how long it would take the Python to swallow that pig. And honestly, there's money still going in. I guess I saw a news report this morning across my desk about there are still $2,500 STEMI checks going out. And the really? the hmm. grossly misnamed, I can't verify that. I just saw the report. The, the grossly misnamed Inflation Reduction Act you know, that money is still, I mean, it was appropriated years ago, but it's still just now, some of it's still just going out the door. Shovels mm-hmm. are starting to hit dirt on some of these projects, but other ones are just getting off the drawing books. So, I mean, arguably, we jumped the gun on, on that pig going through the python. It, it took a lot longer than we expected. And we'll see. But to 
I'm saying is, you know, you brought up something really important. This is something, again, Jeff Gunlock has pointed out, and you can see the chart, um, his chart or mine. Uh, actually, I don't think I have that posted on the website. It was in the weekly digest, which only exists as an email. So I'll have to I'll have to post that chart, but it's out there. You can look for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it says we're going through the ring. Now, when is the billion dollar question these days, or perhaps the trillion dollar question adjusted for inflation. <laughs> I have the feeling that it's it's long overdue and that markets are much more fragile than they let on. And you see this whenever there's something unexpected happens, there's a big sell off in the markets. It seems to me like a bunch of long tail cats in a room full of rocking chairs, like everybody's just ready to bolt as soon as they, you know, the door opens and they're, they think the party's over. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's the impression I get, my, my vibe for the market. Mm-hmm. Um, and that could tip things over. Now, the, for that is it's also an election year. But to the people out there who say, oh, it's proven, therefore, like it's demonstrated, if it's an election year, we can't have a recession. Uh, no, that's not true. I mean, the powers that be, they'll send out money, helicopters, they'll do what they can. But sometimes it's like, uh, you know, pushing on a string. Sometimes just throwing money at something doesn't cure what ails you. And in fact, it could cause the opposite reaction. If if the powers that be panic and they pull out emergency, while at the same time saying everything is fine, we have the strongest economy ever, which, by the way, it, that's not just the current administration saying that. But the predecessor of the current occupant of the White House said the same thing. You know, they're always going to say that, right? So, so if you say that and at the same time you panic, and you send out, you know, emergency measures. You know, something doesn't add up. And you know, there comes a point where, you know, even the person who never studied economics or whatever, I, I'm not trying to sound insulting here, but just the average Joe just calls BS on. And and you could you could say, well, gee, the average Joe doesn't know anything. What do they know? They voted for this guy or that guy or whatever that you don't like. But the average Joe is perhaps misinformed, but I really believe not entirely stupid or is not stupid at all. I mean, just look at the upset over inflation. The powers that be keep trying to ram it down their throats. Oh, we've tamed inflation. It's only 2% or 3%. Everything's fine. We fixed the problem. But the average Joe goes to the store and everything is more expensive than they remember. They just aren't buying it. And that's why these you know, the current administration people, they're pulling their hair out. Why doesn't Biden get any credit for how wonderful the economy is? Well, because you can publish all the massage uh, if not invented government statistics you want, if people go to the store and everything's more expensive, they think it sucks, mm-hmm. right? That's a technical economic description there, right? It's, it sucks. Their experience <laughs> sucks. So they just don't believe, you know, whoever the liars in office are at the moment. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good thing. So the point is that it's it's not a guaranteed thing that these masters of the universe can actually prevent bad stuff from happening you know, with the tools that they have. And I think even they know that, like even, even the, the Krugmans of the world with their trillion dollar coins, they know, they say, or the, or the, the Stephanie Kelton's of the world print all we want. It doesn't matter. Like if you say, well, why don't we just send everybody a billion dollars? Oh no. Well, you know, that's ridiculous. Well, but, but it shows that yes, there are limits, right? So I, at the powers that be understand that they have a fine line to tread here. And if they, if they cause a panic, you know, like it, even if they try to do something helpful, like send people thousands of dollars, they can cause a panic. They can burst their own bubble. So it's it's not a guaranteed thing that an election year, year means we can't have a recession. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, you know, the gun lock indicator just triggered the, the lag between that and the actuality could be actually a year. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think the things are fragile enough. I could be wrong, but I'll be surprised if we don't see undeniable recession by the end of this year. And probably, you know, significant nervousness cracks in the in the armor this summer. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting you brought up that analogy of the long tail cats in the room of rocking chairs where everybody's ready to bolt out of the stock market. You know, you recently posted on Twitter a chart of stock market optimism. And it being at something like a three-year high, that to me seems like you know maybe a contrarian and a contrary indicator to what we're talking about. Well, I mean, it, 
could be if you believe in the wisdom of masses. And by the way, I don't say that sarcastically. There, there is something to be said for distributed intelligence and, and the market is a is a, a mechanism for mobilizing that information, that distributed knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also, I think, you know, just look at stock market crashes and what happens right before. I mean, you know, 1929, 2008, I mean, the, the, the highs come before the lows. Mm-hmm. So I, I wouldn't actually say that it's a, I mean, as a contrarian, I look at what looks like irrational exuberance and I, and I, you know, I, I'm salivating, I'm rubbing my, my claws together here, looking for the opportunities, because it seems like that always is what comes right before the crash. So Lobo, in this vein, you know, when we're seeing a possible recession within this time zone, is it possible that this changes your thesis or your expectation of where copper is headed, considering how, you know, how tied to the economy and demand, world demand that copper is. Right. But it's good that you put it that way. And and just to be clear about this, if I'm wrong about the recession, I'm still bullish on gold. Mm -hmm. Because the Fed is still saying, oh, we've solved the problem. We're going to, we're going to, rates, everything's fine. And a rate cutting cycle is historically bullish for gold. So, even if I'm wrong on the recession thesis, that doesn't really change my marching orders for gold, and certainly not uranium, mm-hmm. which is baseload power, and I don't think it cares that much at all about whether we have a recession. Uh, in fact, that's another chart I have. In three out of the four last recessions, uranium went sideways or up. So um, copper, though, is different. It's Dr. Copper. It's right. It's really an economic indicator in its own right. Economic indicator, though, not a leading indicator. It's more mm-hmm. like a present or trailing indicator. So uh, when people said copper went up this year, isn't Dr. Copper telling you you're wrong about the recession? My answer was no. Um, and if we look at the correction we've seen in copper already, I think we saw basically a short squeeze in the in the physical market moving the price. And that some of those short-term issues are starting to be resolved, and we've seen this correction in copper. So, so no, I don't think it was Dr. Copper telling me about the economy. I think it was copper, the commodity, responding to metal-specific impulses. But in terms of my marching orders, you're, you're quite right. That does change things. Like gold didn't change either way. But if I'm wrong about the economy, then I want to start buying copper stocks before they take off again. Because mm-hmm. the overall copper scarcity narrative is now so obvious to everybody that even CNBC is running 10-minute segments on why the world is running out of copper. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, right? That's uh, almost, talk about contrary indicators, that almost makes me nervous about my copper thesis if CNBC is going to talk about it. But no, we're still early. We're looking at a multi-decade bull in copper. I'm extremely bullish on copper. And the thing that's been holding me back from adding more copper to my portfolio is my perception that copper itself and copper stocks will get whacked if I'm right when the recession in the US becomes undeniable. Uh, I still think that, so I still haven't bought more copper stocks. So if I'm wrong about the recession or the moment it becomes not just uncomfortable for me as a, as a market forecaster, but the moment it becomes evident that I am wrong, mm-hmm. The long it was it was different this time. No long and variable lags. No recession. Uh, you know, Powell pulled off the miracle, right? If, if when that becomes what's undeniable, then I need to change my marching orders, and mm-hmm. that would have me right away into copper, oil too. By the way, other things we'll see, but copper and oil right away. And here's the thing: like, so if if that's a risk, you know, why not buy some copper stocks now? Well, A, I have some, you know, I didn't sell everything because I can always be wrong. I hedge my own portfolio. So I I do have some exposure here and my clients do too. Um, And B, I don't see copper like going to 16 bucks overnight or something. This this isn't the sort of market that that just doubles quickly like that. It's a much bigger market than say lithium, for example. So the, the, the crazy rise we saw in lithium um, I don't think that happens to copper. And that means that we have time. So if if I'm wrong about the economy and we're just going basically into a reflationary boom now, 
then there will be time. I, okay, I will have missed the bottom. Absolutely. It's behind us. I missed it. I'm sorry. I didn't get the cheapest prices. But the, but the, the ramp upwards from there is so big and so high and so durable that who cares if I missed the bottom? Okay, I care. I would have liked to have gotten cheaper. But you know, there will still be so much money to be made in that market that I'm fine. And suppose I chicken out and say, oh, well, Dr. Copper is telling me I'm wrong. It, long and variable lags, oh, this too, I'm impatient. It's been too long. I'm going to start buying copper and oil. And then three months from now, six months from now, it turns out, oops, the Fed did break something. Recession cut, hits, right? And all these things go on sale 50% off or something, right? Mm -hmm. Then, uh, A, I'll look like a schmuck, which isn't my favorite look. Uh, but B, I'll, I mean, and perhaps more importantly, I'll be kicking myself because I knew it, right? I chickened out. Uh, but then that comes back to C, and I'm not going to put the wrong finger up there. But the uh, you know the third finger would be you know as I'm saying, if I'm wrong, there'll be time to make money because we're looking at a multi-year bull market, if not multi-decade bull market. Mm -hmm. So since there's time to make money, and the consequences of being wrong now, well, actually for me as a newsletter writer, the consequences are different. If I'm just a private investor and I'm wrong. <laughs> You know, maybe I just ride out the storm if I believe in the company, right? It's not going away. It's this is a great company. It's going to be there. It goes on sale fifty percent. I just buy more, or I quietly huddle, hold, as the case may be, right? Fine. But as a public figure, you know, if I make the wrong call, then you know I'll get a lot of blowback for that. So I'd rather miss the bottom. And my thesis has always been I'd rather miss the bottom and jump in when it's safe to do so than to call a bottom and be wrong. So we'll see. Well, what you kind of touched on earlier, this idea that silver was really following copper for a long time instead of gold. And now that has kind of shifted. So why are you not convinced, let's say, that silver will perform alongside gold? Well, actually, I am more convinced this year. I have changed my tune on this. I, I have to say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit nervous about this because the data is not entirely conclusive. But if you ran a correlation of silver versus copper and silver versus gold over the last year, which we just did recently, silver was, in fact, more correlated with copper than gold. Now, they're both close. Like silver was over 0 0.9 and, and uh, silver and copper was over 0 0.9. Silver and gold was just under. So they were close. So it wasn't this huge difference. It's not like they're all going in different directions. Mm. But, but if you looked at the charts, right, on a daily basis, weekly basis, or you looked at these charts and you thought, well, gee, silver is really acting more like copper. Or, or there were days where gold would go up and silver and copper would go down and they would move at the same time, like responding to the same forces differently from gold. You could just see it. You were not imagining things. The correlation coefficient tells you that in the last year or so. Silver has, in fact, been moving more with copper than gold. Now, this year, you know, silver, unlike what your uh, silver bulls will tell you, you know, usually silver lags gold in a breakout and then it more than catches up in the end. Well, silver didn't wait this time. It took off right away with gold and actually outperformed gold on a percentage gain basis um, this year. So it's, it's not, it's, you know, that was good news in, in terms of gold broke out, silver broke out. That, that made me feel much better. Even though I'm lovingly called Darth Silver, it made me feel much better about silver this year to see it move with gold. Uh, but then I looked at copper again, and it, as I'm saying, the correlation is high, and it turns out that copper moved up at the same time. Mm -hmm. So was it really the case that silver was tracking gold higher this year? Or was it that copper happened to be going in the same direction? Mm -hmm. I was... I was worried about that. But quite recently, we've seen with this copper correction that silver is acting more like gold. Like it's distinctly different. This is literally like the last week or two where we're seeing silver really acting more like gold than copper. And this is pretty, you know, it doesn't prove what will happen the rest of the year, but this is conclusive to me that the drivers for silver are, are still monetary. It's still acting as a monetary metal should. And that is very important. And you were talking about my marching orders, and it has, in fact, changed my marching orders. Earlier this year, I was mostly bullish on gold. Uranium was last year. Uh, then the uranium correction came, and I liked uranium again. And then this business of silver not trailing gold and acting more like gold 
put silver back on my shopping list, which it was not there at the beginning of this year. So yeah, I'm willing to admit I'm wrong. Sometimes I will change my tune. And Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of silver, uh, right now, my problem isn't with the commodity. My, My issue is really finding great companies that are not in basket case countries going the wrong direction. You know, you don't need me to name names there, I think. Well, I, I would like to get to that. But I, before we do, I do want to acknowledge and say that I can absolutely appreciate you saying when you're wrong and changing your thesis, let's say, based on new data. I think that's very valuable. And especially as a as a newsletter writer, as a, as a public figure, as you said, I think that's very important. And hopefully, you know, others can look at that with the same value. But exactly in that vein, Lobo, why is Mexico now a no-fly zone to you for investing capital into? It really is. Um, it, it's funny. I posted something about this on Twitter and some guy really reamed me for fear-mongering and you know, not presenting any data. And it's, you know, But it's Twitter. I got 160 characters. It's not a peer-reviewed journal. <laughs> See, I posted an unsupported opinion on Twitter. Nobody ever does that. I must be really crazy, right? Well, but no, I mean, I've been there several times during this election campaign, and I've talked to people on the ground. And my sense was that the risk here is was real. And by the way, I got the election right. I said, despite there was optimism that uh, Sochi would pull off a Trump style surprise victory, didn't happen. Uh, I was right about that. You know, Claudio won, and it really, you know, my my sense from people in country is, and you hear this from the miners, of course, the people who are peddling their stock are never going to tell you, we're really worried about the political direction that Mexico's taking. Um, and yet you look at, you know, a very, a certain very large silver producer that was almost entirely Mexico focused, suddenly buying an asset, a large asset in Nevada. Uh, you know, that I, you know, they don't have to tell you, oh, we're worried about Mexico to, for you to sort of read between the lines there and say, well, gee, there's some political diversification here going on. Why would that be? Right. So uh, basically what I'm saying is, you know, forgive me, uh, mining company CEOs, but I'm talking to shareholders here. Shareholders, you just, even if they're not lying or whatever, you just can't listen to a CEO of a company that's 100% or 90% or 51% exposed to Mexico risk. They have an incentive. And even the most honest one in the world is going to have a hard time balancing that incentive and their job as a CEO. Um, you know, none of these guys or gals is ever going to come out and say, yeah, Mexico really sucks. We're looking to get out of here uh, until after they've done it. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, this is not going to happen. So anyway, point is, I, I have written about this. There's stuff in the Free Digest about research I did. I went there. I looked. I was right about the election. I'm deeply concerned about the direction of the country. And it's not just the administration at the top. You know, the legal problems some of the juniors have had there some of the producers, the problems with license renewals and things. Um, The rule of law is decaying in that country, apart from the issue of the top level um, anti-mining hostility. And make no mistake, the new president of Mexico is an environmentalist who doesn't like mining. And do not kid yourself that, oh, the, the constitutional ban they're talking about is just on open pit mining, so everything else is safe. No. A government crazy enough to put a constitutional ban on open pit mining in place is crazy enough and anti-mining enough to really stick it to any kind of mining. So (laughs) I have eliminated (laughs) Mexico risk from my portfolio. I will say I had some stocks that I was up on enough that I had already implemented, you know, what I call an upside maximizer. I recovered my initial investment. So I, I literally can't lose on these. So I left some of that money on the table because I can't lose and I could be wrong. And, or they have projects that, you know, are not open pit or whatever. So I can't say that I sold everything and I have no exposure to Mexico at all. I can't say I have no risk. Like if my remaining Mexico stocks go to zero, I cannot lose a penny on them. Mm-hmm. Right. So if they're doing good work and they're, you know, adding value in the ground, I I felt no need to sell entirely, but I have gone risk free. 
Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Is this an example of NIMBYism or not in my backyard? Is this just another perfect example of that, Lowell? Uh, you know, as an interviewer, you hate it when your guest says nothing for too long. But I'm trying to be careful about my response here. And I think yes and no, but more no. Okay. And I, I, I don't want to, <laughs> I'm going to be called a fear monger no matter how I put this. But I think there's a trend in Latin America. It's not just Mexico. I think there's, it's not just NIMBYism. I think there is a sense in Latin America that mining is part of the bad old days. And we don't need no stinking mining. It's the 21st century. We're modern countries now. We've got IT savvy. We're doing all this stuff. You know, we don't, we don't need no mines anymore. That was in the bad old days. Um, and even pro, uh, you know, long-term pro mining countries like Chile have, you know, year after year been making mining more and more difficult. And, you know, the political kerfuffles in Peru aren't really directly mining related, but the country's become more unstable. And the, the social permitting problem is huge there. And I see this all up and down Latin America. Basically, the moral high ground has been given to the native or, or local communities when it comes to mining. And so if they get upset, if they break the law, if they have illegal road blockades or other actions they take, you know, they are breaking the law, but the government doesn't do anything to them. Right. And it's the company's problem to sort this out. How do we figure this out? And it, you know, if you're a, a, an American or Canadian company, you're not supposed to just bribe people. So that's the most effective way to figure these things out. But you can, you're not supposed to do that, or at least you can't admit to doing that. And by the way, uh, executives from certain Asian countries, companies there, they have much less issue with this. And they seem to be making much more quicker progress in third world countries getting permits and projects built. Uh, so without it making any uh, <laughs> bold accusations there, I think it's it's pretty evident, you know, when it's easier and harder to grease the skids in countries like that. Mm -hmm. Answer to the question is, it's not just NIMBYism. I think it's a, a sort of anti-colonial anti sentiment also. And and there is a there is a big attitude shift for the young people. They just have no use for mining in a lot of these Latin American countries. You talk to them, and I have. I've talked to people in Colombia, for example, and you know they just they just don't see it. They, that's that's the past. You know, it's kind of like they bought the 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 Bitcoin propaganda anti gold, but that's but writ large against all mining. So the cautionary tale here is actually. I, I, I'm not saying sell all of Latin America, but I'm saying be very, very careful. There's a very powerful social trend here where, again, when you give the moral high ground, and by the way, I'm not saying these poor local communities have no rights or no interest or no stake. That's not what I'm saying. But if you give them veto power, they're going to use it. Mm -hmm. And that's going to make permitting at the very least very difficult, lengthy, and expensive, if not impossible. Um, and it just, just be very, very careful. I, I think permitting risk in all of Latin America is screaming higher. And it's, it's a, some of my mentors like to downplay political risk. And at some point price trumps risk, even political risk, mm -hmm. but don't dismiss it. Don't ignore it. This is real. And it will bite you on the posterior if you ignore it. Are there any other jurisdictions that are encouraging in Latin America to be investing in right now? Obviously Argentina. Right. We'll see. I, my biggest concern with Argentina wasn't that Millet was a stooge or an idiot or would do the wrong thing or whatever. Uh, my biggest concern was that if he actually did try to do anything real and reform things, that he'd get shot or, you know, there'd be a, a riot and a mob and a, and a, a literal revolution um, or coup d'etat or something like that. None of that's happened. And that's really interesting because he has within his power as executive, like he hasn't been able to get the legislature to put through his big reform packages, but within what he could do as executive, which in Latin America countries, they've made the presidents very powerful. Mm -hmm. There's a lot he could do. And he did. And it's already producing enough results. Like he hasn't saved Argentina yet. But, you know, the bow is visibly swinging away from the iceberg, right? He, there, there's, there's reason for hope. And his popularity has remained high. Like that 
exasperation, desperation that swept him into office, it's still there. It hasn't gone away. It's still supporting him. And he's made enough of a dent that people are saying, you know, holy cow, this might work. And, you know, even, you know, IMF, World Bank or whatever, even those types are talking about helping out. Now, so there's a chance here that Argentina could actually become the best place for capital south of the border here. And assuming he doesn't, you know, step in front of a bullet and he continues in this direction. And here's the here's the thing. Like, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but his term is four years and he's not even, you know, he's halfway into the first one. So, um, you know, three and a half years is enough time to build a project that's already started. Or it's enough time to take a discovery and get it to the feasibility stage. You know, these things that add value, taking something from an idea to something with a net present value, you know, fully discounted net present value with a, you know, robust rate of return. That value can be added for shareholders before Millet can be voted out of office. So if he's Mm -hmm. not going to get shot, there's enough time here to make money on Argentina plays. And there's enough optimism now with, you know, stuff really happening that, I see Argentina as investable now. And in fact, I have bought uh, shares in at least one Argentina play. Well, hopefully that trend continues of him, you know, not walking in front of a bullet, because I know, as we're just talking about Mexico, that was one of the bloodiest election cycles with, I think it was 37 or 38 presidential candidates getting murdered. No, not president, local candidates, mayors and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but either but way, that's, that's before. I mean, I, I we've, you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, we like to think of Mexico as this, uh, you know, no longer banana republic. It's just like us. But you know, got to remember, it wasn't so long ago. They, in, the Mexican government in the 1960s, when the Olympics were there, sent in the soldiers and massacred the uh, student protesters at the time. It was sort of like Tiananmen Square. And this isn't, you know, the Communist Party of China. This was, you know, nice, you know, Mexico, home of the margarita, right? Um, I, have, I have an uncle who was there in, you know, and he he got saved because he literally got hungry and he went for a sandwich or a torta, as they call them. And he left this, the square. And when he came back, the soldiers had surrounded it and he couldn't get back in. Lucky for him, he couldn't get back in. He was saved by his stomach. <laughs> like, you know, okay, so you say, oh, the 60s, well, that was a, that was a long time ago. Well, mm-hmm. um, you know, the institutions are still there. And, you know, as you're pointing out, the violence is still there. Uh, you know, the, the it's a it's an interesting time. And I, I say this with, you know, I have a large family in Mexico. I'm I'm not anti-Mexico. I wish it mm-hmm. weren't so. It's very sad. But, uh, you know, as a investor, as an investor and as a public figure trying to offer the best guidance I can to anybody who cares to listen, I have to say that the situation is uh, very serious. Um, Let me put it this way. My Colombian friends are sad for Mexico. They see Mexico going down the path that took them to decades of internal warfare uh, between, you know, the the corrupt politicians and the drug cartels and all this stuff, they, they, to them, it looks like what happened in Colombia, mm-hmm. And that's pretty scary. Well, boy, I want to end up wrapping up on an article that you wrote that is on your website. People can go check out are gold mining stocks broken and should, or can we be taking any lessons from that 2016 kind of head fake? that we saw in the mining shares? Well, uh, if you had asked me a month or two ago, I, this my answer might have been theoretical. But now that we saw this breakout here, particularly since you know April, um, you know, we saw really gold head up almost to 2,500, mm-hmm. and we saw the gold stocks move. You know, my answer to that question in the article, which is a free article, you know, is that no, gold stocks aren't broken. There are reasons like that 2016 head fake. And uh, I think more importantly, the the big spike in 2011 to almost 2000 and then multi-year bear market. The only thing like that before then 
was the 1980 spike and then multi-year bear market. So 2020 comes along, you get this huge spike, and it's not unreasonable for investors to look at it and say, well, what's the track record of a huge spike in gold? A multi-year bear market comes afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'm not the only one who said this, my friend Adrian Day, fellow Puerto Rican, has also said that the market was, the, the stocks were basically leading the metal lower. The market, the smart money looked at the past, looked at your track record and said, well, the spike is not sustainable. It's going to go lower. And the gold stocks were heading lower. And that made them look broken because gold didn't head lower. And it was kind of like, <laughs> you know, Linus in the pumpkin patch. People say that about me in the recession. But these, these gold bears kept expecting gold to come down. And, and the stocks would not move because that was where the big, the smart money was. You know, the average retail person who listens to us, unfortunately, you know, we don't move the markets writ large, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, so so the smart money was was betting on lower gold and they were wrong. And I think, you know, at last, it's been four years now. We're, all, we're going on four years since that spike. So already that's completely different from 2011 and 1980. This is not an echo of that. And when it went up to almost 2,500 and now you've got such... You know, uh, you know, non gold bug outfits is City and, and Bank of America calling for three thousand dollar gold and stuff like that. You know, the, the it's quite striking to see that change in tune. Mm -hmm. and so I was my thesis was no gold stocks are not broken, and I think this year we've seen that leverage. Like, why do we even bother with these crappy little mining stocks, Tom? Because if gold goes up, you know, one percent in a week, the stocks will typically go up five ten percent. Mm -hmm. The smaller the stock, the more leverage you get to the underlying commodity. If they didn't do that, we wouldn't bother. You have all the risks with these companies. You know, they can get regulated out of his existence or the permitting setbacks, or they just drill and don't discover the deposit. All these things that can go wrong can't go wrong with the metal itself. So if the stocks aren't going to go up more than the metal, why would you bother? Just buy the metal, mm -hmm. right? So it was a reasonable question to ask because the stocks kept on not doing their job. Well, this year they did. And you could see at least the, you know, the quality stocks, the companies that actually had something, not just miners, but you know, developers or, or explorers that actually had a discovery of some merit. They showed that leverage that we want to see. They, they moved more than gold did. And that's really important. That says that you know, my, my, my theory isn't just a theory. It's actually mm -hmm. happened. Oh, the stocks aren't broken. The circumstances that were holding them down, I think this is not an inevitable or an imminent. This is a this year happening now kind of thing. Uh, if I'm right about gold heading up this year, I think we will see the gold stocks respond with gusto, not underperforming as they have been in recent years. And what are some, you know, carrots that might make big investors and big money that understands basic math come back into the miners? Well, uh, I, I think it helps. If I'm right about the new buyer that we talked about, just like generalist portfolio managers, money managers saying, you know what, a bit of allocation to gold makes sense. I think that's like the, the gateway drug, if you will. That's not a very positive image. But once you've got some gold in your portfolio, then it's not so alien to say, well, how can I do more with this? What else can I do? If you don't need no stinking gold, right, it's it's a pet rock, a barbarous relic, then you're just out. But once you've got some gold in the portfolio, it's, it's reasonable to say, well, how can I get some leverage? How can mm -hmm. I do better? How can I beat the index? Right? And the gold stocks help you to beat the index if gold is the index. And that's a very classic money manager question to ask. So I, I think we'll see that. I also think that the, the, the producers, the big producers tend to lead the way. We had a, a series of I wouldn't call it a blowout quarter exactly, but the big producers, they all beat guidance in Q1. And that got that got enough attention that even the Bloombergs and CNBCs of the world notice when a very large mining company, gold mining company beats guidance. If they do that again for Q2, and if the general, the broader market is weakening at the time, I think that could be very explosive. But even if the broader markets aren't weakening, the fact is if it's an industry making money, the margins are expanding. They have a moat because it's so difficult to permit new mines. Even a Warren Buffett type could make a case for an investment like this. And in fact, he did buy 
a large gold company a while back, or one of his lieutenants did. Mm-hmm. Lobo, I think that's a perfect idea to kind of wrap up on. Is there anything that you want to leave our listeners to think about before we do? Sure. Uh, one, don't forget about uranium. And people are, are not hating uranium again, but they're just sort of ignoring it because it's doing nothing. Mm-hmm. But doing nothing at a level that is more than enough to make the business profitable is huge. I think that is another, it's a great business, maybe even a Warren Buffett friendly business in the sense that the, you know, the supply and demand there, it's just like, it would take a Chernobyl scale event to derail that investment thesis. So I like it a lot. And if you want to know more about what I like and what I'm thinking, you know, please come to independentspeculator.com. I have a free weekly letter called the Speculators Digest that exists only as an email. You can only get those charts there. And if you do sign up, I promise not to spam you. We, we won't flood your inbox with daily advertisements and stuff. I hate that. Mm-hmm. And of course, excellent Twitter follow as well, at due diligence guy. Lobo, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate your wisdom. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.